the University of New Mexico Press has been around for about 90 years, and I worked there about half that time. So I know so much that I had to keep shaving pieces off of my talk because otherwise you would be here until next week. Um, uh, I'm going to start by talking about what I refer to as the prehistory of the press, which existed for quite a while before I showed up. <laughs> and so we're going to start with the founding of the press, which was established in 1929 by the regents. And I think that what they really wanted to do was organize the printing that was being done at the university. But had they had loftier ideas, they probably would have said, we have to have a publishing operation because we're a scholarly institution and scholars write things and they need to have a publisher. The other real reason that universities have presses is not so lofty, it's really for prestige. Um, you know, if you think of the oldest, most prestigious university presses in the world, you think of Oxford University Press, it was founded in the 15th century. That's class. And I'm sure that the regions of UNM were interested in class, although they probably weren't that ambitious about it. But all the time that I was director at the press, every president was supportive of the press at least as far as lip service goes, because they all wanted to be eligible to be members of the AAU, which is the Association of American Universities. If you Google AAU, it says Amateur Athletic Union, but that's, <laughs> that's not the right one. <laughs> so I always tried to get as much good publicity as possible because I figured that's really what the university wanted. They wanted fame and glory. So actually, though, back in 1929, they just wanted to organize some of the printing operations. And they didn't differentiate between printing and publishing, which is not surprising because lots of people to this day don't differentiate between printing and publishing. And in fact, there's a pretty simple distinction. Printers manufacture books, publishers sell books. That's, that's really the difference. Um, and you know, the books that you are familiar with now are published books where the publisher has paid a printing and binding company to manufacture the books. We won't go into e-books, that's, that's out of my league here. So I thought you would like to hear what the very first publication that ever came out of UNM was. This was when the university was barely 10 years old. There was no press at the time, but people were already writing and publishing. And so this was really a booklet, not a book. And it was published under the auspices of a part of UNM, I have to say, I've never heard of, the Hadley Climatological Laboratory. And the name of this publication was Physiological Corollaries of Equilibrium Theory of Nervous Action and Control. <laughs> Doesn't sound like climatology to me, but whatever. And the author was Clarence Herrick. I don't know anything about him. Um, it was 30 years before there was a university press, and ev but eventually it was labeled volume one, number one, in the biological series of bulletins published by UNM. And there were a lot of bulletins of that kind that came out over the years, and nobody kept track of them. I mean, I, I never could figure out if they were published by UNM Press or not. But eventually, in the, <laughs> the present century, a local book collector and former UNM Press employee, Joe Westbrook, made a point of trying to collect a full set of these, and he very kindly donated them to UNM. So they're there if you ever want to find out about nervous action and control. <laughs> so the, we're still in prehistory here, and the, the press is really mostly a printing operation. But that gives me a chance to mention a couple of journals that the press published. The press doesn't publish journals anymore. It's usually kind of a, a 
a lot of extra personnel are required to publish journals. So there are some university presses that publish them and an awful lot that don't. But UNM published the New Mexico Quarterly, which was a literary publication, and it was actually within UNM Press, because at one time I had an office with a filing cabinet that was full of old New Mexico Quarterly correspondence. But it was, the Quarterly was shut down in 1968. There was some financial and scandal reasons for that, so no more New Mexico Quarterly. The press also used to publish the New Mexico Historical Review, and that, of course, still exists, but it's not connected to the press. It's published out of the history department. So with all this printing going on, the university decided they needed to hire somebody to run the printing operation. And to my eternal confusion, the name of the person that they hired to do this was Fred Harvey. Which, you know, we all know Fred Harvey started hotels and restaurants, but this was a different Fred Harvey. As far as I can see, there's no connection at all. He moved to New Mexico from Florida, where he had been a newspaper man and a printer, I guess, to take this job. And he, he had it for quite a while. And it was while he was the director, after he'd only been there for a couple of years, that the press actually published two books. And the first one, I mean, we're talking books, you know, with a spine and hardcover binding and a jacket, maybe. The first book was called New Mexico History and Civics. And the author was Lansing Bloom. Oh. Yeah, you, you all have heard of him, and he has a son who's, I think, still extant around here. He was the editor of the New Mexico Historical Review, and I, I think was also on the faculty. And then uh, that's known to be the press's first book, but they published a second book just a few months after that, I think, that was called America in the Southwest, and that's a literary anthology with two editors, one of whom was T.M. Pierce, who taught in the UNM English Department and was an incredibly energetic and long-lived person. He was still running around busily writing books when I came to work there in the 1970s. And the, the other editor was Telfair Hendon, who I know nothing about at all, but I assume he taught at UNM. And both of those books sound to me like they were textbooks. Um, if they weren't, they probably were used as textbooks. And that raises a question that people often ask you if you work at a university press, which is, does the press exist to publish textbooks for use in the university? I mean, that would be too logical, because it really doesn't. UNM Press has published textbooks, but that's not really its main purpose in life. And it's always great if a book is used in classes because it guarantees more sales. So it's, you know, like everything else, more complicated than you might think. The other question that people always ask is, oh, does the press exist to publish books by the faculty at UNM? Another perfectly logical assumption, but it doesn't. Although, obviously, its early books were by the faculty. The, the press has a specialty. All publishing companies specialize in something. And the press specializes in New Mexico history and culture, really. In the, the Oops. Darn. I can probably make myself heard perfectly well without this little thing. No, you need the microphone. Oh, OK. Will you do the honors there? I'm so sorry. Great. I'm going to not wave my hands around anymore. Um, okay, so where are we? Oh, yes, I was talking about textbooks and so forth. I mean, w one of the early long-lived successful books that the press published clearly was a textbook, Practical Spoken Spanish which was around for so long, probably some of you have consulted it. It was in print for at least 50 years and was I, probably the press's bestseller for quite a bit of that time. I, I don't know. So we're sort of lurching towards the actual publishing history of the press.
And it's time for me to mention peer review, which is really what makes a university press different from commercial publishers. And that has to get organized. For a long time, I think that there were just a bunch of faculty members who evaluated everything that came into the press. And they finally figured out they needed to be a little more kosher than that. So they said, OK, if you're a UNM author, you have a peer review from outside the university. And if you're an author from outside the university, then somebody from the university can peer review you. It's you know, and it, it continues to this day. Peer review is incredibly important and incredibly useful, but I've often found it to be something of an obstacle in publishing things that I really wanted to publish. And I was just very stubborn about peer review. If I found a book that I thought really ought to be published at the University of New Mexico Press and the peer reviewer didn't like it, I would just keep asking other people to peer review until I got enough <laughs> favorable stuff. And that worked really well. I think the all-time champion among the books that I did that with, I had eight peer reviewers by the time I took it to the faculty committee. And it's still in print, so I did something right. It came out in 1987. And it's still in print 35 years later. So anyway, that happened. And that kind of takes us up to the actual history of the press, where we had a beautiful picture of Coronado Night of Pueblo and Plains, which is going to come back from Mr. Jones here, I think. Because that is really sort of the first important book that the press published. 1940 is when that came out. Isn't it beautiful, that just gorgeous typography? And I know who designed it. I can recognize it. Anyway, 1940 was the 400th anniversary of the Coronado expedition into what is now New Mexico. And that was a big deal. And the state created a commission to celebrate this anniversary. And um, they got funding from state funds and federal funds to publish a series of books that was called the Coronado Quarto Centennial Publications. And that book, Coronado, was the first one in the series. It came out in 1940, and it's been in print off and on ever since then. I think it's in print now. There were supposed to be 10 books in this series, and they did all get published. But they didn't come out in order, which is interesting. I mean, somebody said, OK, here's our list of books. And they're going to, here's volume one is going to be Coronado, and volume two, so and so. But they weren't written in the right order. Scholars write books at their own pace. So the, the other books in the series, which were mostly editions and translations of significant documents in the period, um, Volume 3 didn't come out until 1966. That was quite a while after 1940. And by that time, Volumes 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10 had all come out. So what about Volume 7? That was the last one to come out. It came out in 2012. <laughs> and I, I was retired from the press, but I was working, right, as Steve mentioned, writing jacket and catalog copy. I never stopped doing that. And I was sitting there in 2012. I was 65 years old. I was writing copy about a book that had been commissioned before I was born. I just I couldn't believe that this book was finally coming out. It had attained legendary status at the press, as you can imagine. And it is a huge tribute, I think, to all the directors of UNM Press after 1940. None of them sneaked the money out of whatever account it was in and used it for something else. And I know they could have done that, but they had faith. And <laughs> the book came out, and there it is. So. Yes, I was just going to say, let me tell you the name of the book. And the, it, there are four authors' names on it. And two of them, of course, were dead by the time the book came out. The, the senior author was Franz Scholes, who was the great historian at the UNM History Department. The book is Juan Dominguez de Mendoza, Soldier and Frontiersman of the Spanish Southwest, 1627 to 1693. 
you can tell that that's a scholarly book because it has a title and a subtitle and dates in it. <laughs> so there we go. So uh, there's a UNM Press has had a large number of directors in the course of its 90-year history. I, and by way of contrast, Johns Hopkins, which is the oldest continuously operating press in the country, when they were 100 years old, I think they had had two directors. UNM Press is 90 years old and has had either 10 or 12, depending on how you count. So I'm just sort of going to say, I can't talk about all of them. There are too many of them, and there isn't enough time to talk about them. But I do want to talk about one who I've always been fascinated by. I know very little about him, but he seems like an unusual person to have worked at a university press at all. His name was E.B. Mann, and he was the director who came after Fred Harvey. And E.B. Mann was a writer of Western novels. He published 17 Western novels. I'm not sure if this was before, after, or during his directorship. And before he came to UNM Press, he was the managing editor of a magazine you've probably heard of called American Rifleman, which is the magazine of the National Rifle Association. And when he left, he came to UNM in 1949, and he left in 1956, and he went off and became the editor of something called Guns Magazine. And he published books that sold pretty well, I think, you know, they were often about, well, what we used to call cowboys and Indians, lawmen, ranchers, etc. And they sold well, but it started to make the faculty really nervous because they were afraid those really weren't scholarly books. And that's where I see the first real iteration of the constant conflict between scholarly books and regional books, scholarly and regional, which is characteristic especially of university presses in the West, because Western history sort of doesn't seem serious to a lot of people. I think it's serious, and I think it's very healthy to have this two-sided approach to publishing, because it, it makes you think about what you're doing, and in, in New Mexico, there's often not much difference between scholarly and regional books. I mean, is a book about Billy the Kid a scholarly book or a regional book? Everybody's got different opinions about that, and those of you who've picked up the catalogs, I think you'll see that they're divided there. They're scholarly books, and then they've created an imprint for the regional books, which are things like tour guides and bird books and so forth, which are great. So one more thing, I just want to bring in E.B. Mann one more time, because he had an idea that I think was a, a good idea and an important idea that he never got to execute. And that was, he thought it would be a good thing to reissue out of print Western fiction that was worthwhile. It never happened to, under his watch. And interestingly, at about the same time, in the 1940s or 50s, I'm not sure which. Um, uh, some professors in the English department approached the press thinking, wouldn't it be a good idea to reprint some underappreciated English novels? And that didn't happen either. The press clearly was not ready to do anything that wasn't scholarly or at least related to New Mexico. So we're almost up to the part of the story where I show up, and that's Roger Shug becomes the director in 1967, and he's the first really professional press director that they've hired. He was at the University of Chicago Press, and he was about ready to retire from there, and he was brought to New Mexico as a kind of sidestep towards retirement, and the idea was that he was going to whip the press into shape. They had been publishing books too slowly, so they were good books, but there weren't enough of them, and the cash flow was terrible, and they just figured they needed somebody that had worked at a real publishing company before. So about Roger's been there for four years, and this is when I show up just looking for a job, and he hired me 
he was one of his mandates was to professionalize the staff and that is certainly not why he hired me because I was 25 years old and I wasn't a professional anything but what I was was cheap <laughs> I, I made less money working for the press than I had as a graduate student living on a stipend from a fellowship but obviously I, I wasn't living on that so um, I was the low person on a very short totem pole is what I would say and I knew nothing about New Mexico history and I, I you know I think university presses attract two different kinds of people to work at them and one is people who are scholars and know a lot and are interested in the subject matter that the press is publishing the others are people like me who don't know anything about scholarship but want to work in a publishing company and it's it's a benign environment you know it's not so dependent on sales and it was it was just the right thing for me and I set about trying to figure out what was going on and I did that by listening to the two guys who ran the press one was Roger Shug publisher from the University of Chicago Press the other one was a wonderful man named Jack Rittenhouse and I see a few of you nodding you know, Peter remembers him um, Jack was great and he was had a different approach from Roger Shug. Roger wanted the press to publish scholarly books that would be taken seriously not just in the West but outside the West and he actually, Roger published some very good books about New Mexico but I think he just never thought that was quite enough and Jack Rittenhouse who was a Westerner, I mean he was born in the Midwest but he had lived in the West for most of his adult life he was a believer in regional publishing and he had he had a list he was a list maker and he had a list of books that were regional books that all presses ought to publish and these are things like you know birds of New Mexico geology of New Mexico place names of New Mexico and, and UNM press did publish a lot of books not every single one on Jack's list but it worked very well and most university presses in the West and a lot of them in other parts of the country do that too Roger I have to just when I was getting my stuff together for this lecture I stumbled upon an essay that Roger Shug wrote about scholarly publishing which I I don't think I'd ever seen it before and I wanted to quote a sentence from it because it was so strikingly different from the world we live in now I, I not sure when he wrote this but here's what he said true university publishing is the creature of objective scholarship free of any dominating influence by church or state or by race class or political party in a way he's just being idealistic there but we're so conscious of race class and political po parties now that you have people whose whole identity as publishers is that they publish books about race class and political party <laughs> it's different Jack and I had a very different attitude which is like you find yourself somewhere like New Mexico and you stay there and you learn about it and you publish books about it it's a, you know bloom where you're planted you've heard that phrase probably and so I was trained by both of these kinds of people and I noticed right away that there were a couple of books the press had published that were about New Mexico that had gotten a lot of national attention one of them was Tiarina and the Courthouse Raid remember that you remember the Courthouse Raid even if you never read the book and that was a book by a journalist who had covered it for I don't know who a magazine I think and that was a successful book highly praised the paperback rights were sold to Harper I think and that came out in about 1970 I think in 1969 the other really significant book came out with Scott Mamaday's The Way to Rainy Mountain which I think is the most important book the press ever published it's considered really the founding book of American Indian literature and Scott is still alive he's amazing he's still going and people appreciate him now but um, 
That came out in 1969, paperback rights were sold, and, and you understand when paperback rights to these books are sold, it's a lease. So the book, get, the book comes back to the original publisher after a while. And that book has not only been in print since 1969, the last time I checked it was selling better every year than it had the year before, which is kind of an ideal thing for a book to do, and they don't usually do that. During this period, we also published a couple of books by Tony Hillerman, but he was not so famous at the time. He had published like one and a half Joe Leaphorn books, and he, but he was right down the hall because the press was in the journalism building, and he worked in the journalism department. So he would have lunch with Roger Shug and Jack Rittenhouse, and I think he tormented Roger Shug. <laughs> <laughs> he would say, now imagine, let's imagine a plot. There's a bad guy in here and his name is Shug. <laughs> we always heard about this from Mr. Rittenhouse. It was, it was great. So things were moving along, but there was still a, a kind of a mandate to publish more books. And I wanted to mention a couple of the ways that this happened because one of the ways was that the press took over a series of histories of the American West that had been published by Holt Reinhardt and Winston. I think they were meant for college students, but they were serious historical books. And we took over some inventory, but the main thing was it was the brand and the series editor who was Ray Allen Billington, who was a distinguished Western historian. And some of those books are still in print, but the interesting thing is that Western history has changed so much since the mid-1970s when these books first came to us that there are many, many interesting subjects for Western history that nobody wrote books about back in the 70s. They're social history, really. Women in the West, children in the West, Mexican-Americans in the West, so forth. And those have been really important in positioning the press as a great publisher of Western history. The other thing, this isn't as important, but it's important to me. Jack Rittenhouse, among his many lists, was a list of out-of-print Western novels, just like E.B. Mann had suggested, that ought to be brought back into print. So we started bringing those back into print, and a couple of them were great. The one that sold the best was Edward Abbey's first novel, The Brave Cowboy. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but there's a wonderful movie that you absolutely should see because it was filmed on location in Albuquerque in about 1960. So you get to see what Albuquerque looked like. And one of the opening shots in that movie is Kirk Douglas on a horse riding from the west side to downtown Albuquerque. So he splashes through the river on his horse. It's just, it's wonderful. <laughs> it, it, and it has a lot of famous actors in it who weren't famous at the time, like Walter Matthau plays the sheriff. It's a terrific movie. And then, huh? What's the movie called? Uh, the movie is called Lonely or the Brave. Oh, yeah. Black and white. It's black and white. It is, yeah. 1962. To Harris Canyon. Yes, to Harris Canyon is a major part of it. Yeah, and it was filmed there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other reprint from that period that... I'm a big fan of was one of Larry McMurtry's early novels, All My Friends Are Gonna Be Strangers. And you know, that was in the pre-Lonesome Dove period when Larry McMurtry was famous for wearing a sweatshirt that said, minor regional novelist. <laughs> this was one of his minor regional novels, but I've always thought his minor regional novels were better really than almost anything else he did and I love that book and it led me to Larry McMurtry and reading a lot of books that I probably never would have known about otherwise so I thank Jack Rittenhouse for that. Okay well I'm going to get up to where things really got going at the press at this point. Press changes directors so often, and in 1980, we get a new one, and his name is Luther Wilson. And he was an incredibly energetic publisher. He was only 36 years old when he came to work at the press, but he'd already worked at three other publishing companies. 
he tended to move around a lot and he he was just like ready to go he kind of I was already working there he hired several other people who were eager young people and he just said go out and sign books up he never met a book he didn't like that's what we would always say about him and we really came into our own then partly because we had an excellent marketing manager Helen and I were just talking about her who was Joanna Hurley who promoted our books to the New York Times Book Review and the New York Review of Books she would make a pilgrimage to New York a couple of times a year and sell our books basically to the book reviewers and so we got to be better known and I I can't even begin to start talking about all the books that we did but we had a very strong list in Native American studies I mean we we it was a natural thing for us to do and Luther before he came to New Mexico had been at the University of Oklahoma Press which is the great publisher of American history Indian history and anthropology and so forth so he was well connected there and we our list really grew there and we still had Scott Momaday on our list and that was great and I think that is what led us to publish a book that you probably have heard of called The Education of Little Tree which was a amazing I'm just going to tell you the story because it's such an amazing story it was the best thing that ever happened to the press and it was also the worst thing that ever happened to the press and I'm, you know, I tend to think it was good rather than bad but it, one thing it definitely was was scandalous um, The Education of Little Tree was out of print it had been published by uh, Delacorte Press in New York and they had foolishly let it go out of print the author was dead so we were dealing with the author's agent and she wanted to get the book back into print and she didn't know anything about university presses but I think she had heard of Scott Momaday and so she just cold called us and she said I have an out of print memoir by an American Indian that I thought you might be interested in so I said sure send it along and I read it and it made me cry it was a wonderful book but I, I was, I didn't think we could publish it. I went into Luther's office and I said, this is a great book, but it's the wrong tribe. This guy's a Cherokee. And we only publish books about Southwestern tribes. Well, Luther was part Cherokee, so he didn't see anything <laughs> wrong with publishing that. And he said, oh, I know just the right person to peer review it, who was a part Cherokee. <laughs> uh, distinguished lawyer, actually. He was the dean of the law school at the University of Tulsa at the time. Um, so we published it. And <laughs> our first printing was 500 copies. I think we paid an advance to the agent of five hundred dollars. Luther left, he got another job. The book came out after he had left and I had been promoted to director and I had a bestseller on my hands. When the book, had, we hadn't even gotten our five hundred copies in the warehouse and we already had orders for like two thousand more copies. So we just kept having to reprint it and each printing was bigger than the one before so by 1991 it's on the New York Times paperback nonfiction bestseller list it wins a prize it sells a million copies and then um, something very unexpected happens which the, is that there's a column published in the New York Times by a historian who reveals that this book is not a memoir that it is completely made up and that the author while he may have had some Cherokee in him he was not raised by his adorable rural Cherokee grandparents he grew up in some suburban part of Alabama and he was a speechwriter for George Wallace he was a, like this horrible person well this was like all over the national news for several days and then <laughs> this is so weird I was driving in my car and listening to NPR on the radio and I hear this news story 
that in the confirmation hearings for Clarence Thomas that are going on at this very moment, Anita Hill has just testified against Clarence Thomas, and that was even more shocking than the education of Little Tree being written by a racist. So the, the spotlight was off us for a few minutes. But um, <laughs> what happened, of course, was that the New York Times said, this isn't nonfiction. We're moving it over to the fiction side of the bestseller list, where it plummeted to the bottom because if you're on the fiction side, you're competing with Stephen King and Michael Crichton was still alive at the time. People like that. So, you know, we, we, it was still a bestseller for us, but it wasn't for the New York Times anymore. But weirdly, the book continued to sell and the American public, which has no memory at all for this stuff, just kind of forgot all about it and it's still selling well, I think. And I bet you didn't know there was a pretty good movie made of this book. And the reason you didn't know it is, it was made by the same studio that made the movie Titanic, and they came out on the same day. Oh. So nobody paid any attention to the education of Little Tree, but it's still available wherever you get your old movies. And it, it really is pretty good. So, um, even though that was a, a, in many ways, it was a terrible thing for the University of New Mexico Press to publish that book, it made a lot of money for us. And that mattered a lot. It let us do things we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And the other thing that I felt was a huge, I feel looking back on it, was a huge piece of luck was that it happened when it did because you know what would happen if that something like that happened now, we would have to pulp the book, I would have been fired, my career would have been over, and nobody would appreciate this book, which means a lot to a lot of people. It's really, it, even though the author had terrible values, the book espouses excellent values. So it, it's, it's a strange thing. But I look at it now, it's also, we didn't know it was a novel when we published it, but it was the first of a whole lot of novels that we published, and the press became quite a good publisher of literature, which is not what we set out to do, but in 19, I think it was 1992, when we published Rodolfo Anaya's novel Albuquerque. Now, he was already, you know, incredibly well known, and it, this was a very low-risk proposition. He was a faculty member at UNM. He was considered the godfather of Chicano literature. The book was called Albuquerque, so we figured some people would buy it for that reason. And it was, it was a good book. So we published that, and that worked so well that we published a number of other books, both fiction and creative nonfiction, by Chicano and Chicana authors, and that worked well. Um, one of the one that I was the most thrilled about was we published Dagoberto Gilb's first book, and y you all may not know who he is, but he is one heck of a good writer, and I was thrilled that we were able to publish that. And now, we, you know, at a certain point I thought, I wonder what would happen if I published a book by an Anglo writer from Albuquerque, and I did a couple of those, and that worked out okay. So we were off really on a different path without ever stopping being a publisher of scholarly books, and we were very fortunate that we got an endowment to publish a poetry series, and very recently the press received an endowment to publish Southwestern Fiction series. So it was not a super risky thing for us to do, and that's probably what the press is best known for now, even though well, you, if you read the today's Albuquerque Journal, there was a review of a big book by Jeff Bingaman UNM Press published that, and that's interesting to me because you you know you wonder 
would Jeff Bingaman have been able to publish a book with a New York publisher now? Possibly not. He's maybe not famous enough. And the thing about publishing out there in the big world is it's it's so oversized now. You know, it's monopoly capitalism. There was a big case about this in the news recently. And university presses are the place that you go for smaller books now that are valuable, incredibly valuable. Some of you may have read, there was a very nice column in the New York Times, I think it was last Sunday, and it was by Margaret Renkel, who writes about nature and sort of, she's a feel-good columnist, unlike most of the feel-bad people in the New York Times. And she was, I think, asked to write this column because it was either last week or this week is University Press Week. So she was writing about university presses in general and she was particularly singling out some that were from the South because she's a Southerner and that's what she writes about. But everything she said applies to other university presses and I really liked the headline of her column so I'm gonna just shut up and take questions after I tell you her headline which was University Presses Are Keeping American Literature Alive. Then that's, that's it but I'm sure you have questions so thank you. So raise your hands or stand up if you have a question. I have a comment from the internet. Oh, from the internet, okay. <laughs> um, the new, it, it reads, the New Mexico Historical Review still published through the History Department. The press specializes in New Mexico history and culture for those who are interested in genealogy and New Mexico history. These types of publications are quite valuable. I'd like to own the book about Juan Dominguez Mendoza. Thank you for this lecture. The speaker is funny and easy to listen to. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and and you can buy the books wherever you buy your books. I um, I'm sure that I don't know the price of that book about Mendoza, but I bet it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, Janet. So did you? And, I mean, you and him not only has it had a lot of different um, editors of it the press but over the last what 20 years it seems like every three or four years there was a new president of the university I know you know, with, okay. <laughs> so did did the politics of the regions and the president affect did they start telling the press don't publish these kind of books do publish they never intervened editorially they were always more concerned about money um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, they, you know, they, they thought we were expensive, which just drives everybody on the academic side of the university nuts because, you know, we're a winning team, unlike the football team, which <laughs> costs a lot more than we do. <laughs> Sorry, but, you know. <laughs> um, the concern was money and space. And space, yes. We have the spaceman here. <laughs> well, we moved. Like a million square feet of space, and I got to Yeah, we he he. We moved around as many times as we had directors. And Always to a better situation. In fact, we did, and the press is now in a just the prettiest building it's ever been in. It's, which is also one of the oldest buildings on campus, and it's located right across from Skulls Hall and the Anthropology Department, which is a really advantageous position. People often kind of used to forget about the press in some of our more exotic locations, and now we're right in the middle of everything. So, yeah. Yes? So, in general, is the UNM press self-sustaining, or does it run deficit? And when somebody is suggesting a book for you to publish, how many? How do you decide on the print run? I mean, it's a quality <laughs> book. I mean, are more than a couple dozen people going to read it? Or what do you use? What's your criteria? <laughs> Good question. This, yes. Um, 
one, two questions. One is, is the press self-supporting? And the answer is no, not unless the education of Little Tree is around. And <laughs> that actually did make us kind of self-supporting for a while, but it doesn't last. Um, and I, I'll just say one thing about the way the press traditionally was financed. The idea was that the press was supposed to break even, but it never exactly would break even. Um, but what the university did, which was a huge boon to the press, was it provided operating capital. So we didn't have to like scrounge for money for a particular book. What we had to do was pay the university back by selling the book and they would get their money back that way. And that sort of works, but in fact the press is not self-supporting. However, it's now administered by the library. So that means we get benefits like the library has a fundraising department, something the press has never had. And it, it, it's, uh, it's not the ideal, the ideal way to run a university press is to have a huge endowment and the press doesn't have a huge endowment, but at least it's got a sort of very good shell around it in the form of the library and that's the way a lot of university presses are run these days. As for how, we, the other part of the question was how do we decide on a print run and that's a terrible thought. I mean, it, it, they get smaller and smaller and smaller because there isn't very much of an audience for most of these books and libraries don't, contrary to sort of the folklore of academics, there are not an infinite number of libraries that are going to buy extremely scholarly books. So if you wonder why they're so expensive, it's because the print runs only 300 copies, so the fixed costs are spread out over a very small number of books. And in general, you know, because of the state of the book business, print runs are small. They're just, they just are. It's, it's better to do a small print run and a second printing than it is to be optimistic and do a big first printing. And then you just have to remainder the books. So, yeah. Beth, do you know anything about the logo, the history of the logo that's, that's used by the press? Well, I, if it's the logo that I'm thinking of. This one here? The one the on the printer printer printer. Oh yeah, the one on the refrigerator magnet, yes. Yeah, that, that was taken from one of Kenneth Chapman's books on Indian pottery. And I can't remember which Pueblo it comes from, but that's the source of it. That's probably right. Yeah. And nobody from San Ildefonso has ever complained about it, which is interesting. They could have. Because I think, you know, somebody just said, that's a great looking design, let's use it as our logo. Yes. Unlike the Zia Yeah. Yeah. How does the press publish or publicize the book? I repeat the question. Yes, how does the press promote books now? You know, that's a question I don't really have an answer to because I haven't been in that part of the business for so long now. I, I think that, and the press has recently hired a publicist for the first time in a while. They, they had a good publicist for a few years and she didn't like working in book publishing and moved to be a publicist for something else. And there has been no publicist recently, but they just hired one. So I hope something good happens, but I don't really know how they're doing that now. Peter? Would, uh, would print on demand be viable for at least maybe paperback books? There, there is some print on demand that the press does, and they do e-books, of course, a lot. Yeah, they're, they're, the print on demand is a thing. The, th the problem with it is that, again, the books are often extremely expensive. So, you know, I mean, if you have a print a book that is printed on demand that's so expensive that nobody wants to assign it in a classroom, it's 
you know, it's not a great solution in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Sherry Robinson. Oh, hi, Sherry. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure you'd remember me. Um, I can say a little bit about about marketing. Great. Um, on my on marketing is mostly up to the author actually, but um, on my last book, um, this this was when this was when there was this big tumble of employees and everyone was leaving to you know to go someplace else and and I started out with one marketing person and then there was another marketing person and then there was another marketing person and 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 then they kept leaving and until they were down to one one very stretched woman in the marketing <laughs> department who was probably tearing her hair out and um, and then and then they seemed to find a few people and so uh, they, I think they're, I think they're staffed up at this point. But, um, but basically, the press, the press does one push when your book comes out, and then after that, it's up to the author. And that comes as a real shock to authors because they think they've done their work by just writing the book, and it's like once your book comes out, it's you know, the work is just beginning again. I will add that, that that is true not just to the University of New Mexico Press, but in all publishing companies. <laughs> I, I, in fact, you will rarely meet an author who doesn't complain about the marketing of their book. It's part of the, the whole picture. I, I've got a question, too. Sure. When, when, I was, when I was writing Apache Voices and <clears throat> I came across this interesting thing about Jack Rittenhouse that you could maybe I yeah. can confirm or, or deny, but um, <clears throat> and I, I think I came across it in Eve Ball's materials. Uh -huh. um, she, she had spent years interviewing Apaches on the reservation and basically she lived next to the reservation and they came by her house and she became friends with lots of people and she and she interviewed them. So after a period of time she was ready she was ready to write a book, or I think she had written a book. And at the time she was trying to publish um, oral histories, especially Native American or oral histories were not yet accepted. And so um, she had a terrible time getting published. And I think the, the thing I found either in her notes or, or in somebody else who, wrote, who knew her wrote this was that Rittenhouse thought oral history was crap and he was not going to publish it. Oh. So she never got a shot at, U at UNM Press. Um, and she ended up publishing, uh, the first publisher was in Arizona and the next publisher was at BYU. So years later, she wanted to sell her papers and she knew that they were worth something. Um, she never gave UNM a chance because she was still oh. mad. She was still mad that her book had been turned down. New Mexico State didn't get a shot at the papers either because they had just built, they, <coughs> they told her they couldn't afford her papers, but they had just built this huge stadium. <laughs> oh, and that, that kind of ticked her off. <laughs> um, and, and so they ended up at BYU, and that's why, that's why um, anybody who wants to look at those papers has to go to BYU, which is what I'm going to I, that's interesting. Do you, do you remember whether Rittenhouse No, I have no memory of that at all. And it's, it's per perfectly possible that it's true. I just, you know, <laughs> I, I just, I've never heard that. You're having a hard time hearing back here. Oh, can microphone. Up, if people can speak up and enunciate, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Peter. Uh, I have a Rittenhouse story. I, I took a class from him on the history of the book, 
and in, in Zimmerman Library. This was in the late 70s. Hmm. And uh, big, you know, burly guy with his long, long, long mustache and uh, TV coat and everything. Um, and it was excellent. He knew, the, the, you know, book history back to the Chinese and uh, everything. Uh, but the, the, I can't imagine him not liking history because he, he ran a press, Stagecoach Press, which published little Western history books. Yeah, absolutely. But well, Sherry says he didn't like oral history. I, I uh, that I just, you know, I mean, it's perfectly possible. I don't know. He a lot of historians got their information by interviewing people. So that's in a sense that's transmitting oral history. It is. It is. Who knows? Yeah, it seems a little bizarre. My, of course, my other little odd connection to you and Chris is that I had a girlfriend back in those days. I know. And she worked for you. And I know. I remember. So I, was that I remember. Bad. That was how I first met you, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she was... She was a, she was a receptionist. That was a step up for us because when we were in the journalism building for a long time, we didn't have a receptionist. So if if somebody came in off the street to talk to someone, he would just like drift down the hall till he saw somebody. That was actually that was how we. One of the early books that I was involved in was by Robert Coles. Does that name mean anything to anybody anymore? No. One person. Yeah. Well, the, that guy. Yeah. 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 He was a very big deal in the early 70s, and he is not a big deal anymore. I mean, I, I, that's about what I figured that one person in the room would have heard of him anyway. He was, he was in, in Albuquerque for the year working on a book, and he came over to UNM Press for a number of reasons, I think, and he just sort of appeared in somebody's doorway, and we didn't know who he was. <laughs> and, and then he, he, somebody had the presence of mind to ask him what his name was, and I went, oh, oh, <laughs> I know who you are, and we wound up publishing a book of his, so, yeah. Okay, I think we'll bring this program to a close now. Let's get one more round of applause to Beth Hottis. And you can talk to her and her So she's available to stay. I, I will hang out if anybody needs to ask me something, sure. Thank you very much. Oh, well, you're welcome. Let's ask about the horse. <laughs> the horse. <laughs> the horse. <laughs> Thank you.